Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Erica, and I will be um, walking us all through this conversation this evening. Good to see everyone. So this evening, our conversation is about environmental justice, and I am personally very excited for this conversation for a host of reasons. One, I have absolutely um, very many minimal knowledge and understanding on this topic. So like many of you, I hope this evening that I can walk away having learned something. But welcome and thank you so much for your time this evening and thank you for joining Fairfield County's Community Foundation for another community conversation. I'm Erica Stanley. I manage our community capacity building work here at the foundation. And for those who have not yet had the opportunity to meet me and for those I have not had an opportunity to meet, I will just give you a brief overview of my role. I oversee the foundation's community engagement efforts, and that includes our civic engagement grant making, as well as our resident leadership opportunities, and also um, really putting into practice the organizational lever of change that we believe um, is one of the cornerstones of our work, which is aggregating and amplifying community voice. The community conversation series that began last fall in 2020 is one way that the foundation amplifies the voices and lived experiences of folks across the county. It's one of the ways that we, we really carve out a space to amplify great work, critical work, and work that is happening right now in our region. So tonight we will be discussing environmental justice. And as I've already stated, this was one of my personal goals. And I'm very thankful to have had met two women who are doing transformative work in the community and who are really leading in this area. Um, I, in the, our, our previous community conversation, we talked about public health and there were some women who joined us from Bridgeport Hospital Foundation and they walked us through their approach to how they created a community assessment that really helped um, be a responsive plan for individuals on the east side of Bridgeport. And I left that conversation really thinking about ways that public health is intersecting with environmental issues. And so it was really important for me to have a timely response to that conversation and follow it up with an extension of thought around how does health impact our community and how does our community impact our individual health, but also the health and well being of our county at large. And so I'm really happy that I was able to meet Anne a couple of months ago. And what started out just as a simple one on one, of which I have many at the foundation, I quickly knew in that conversation I wanted to have her on a community combo because A, Anne is so insightful and she's truly an expert in her field, but also um, I wanted her to be able to talk to folks who I know care deeply about where we live, right? All of us are thinking about Fairfield County in a really um, specific way, whether that's as a donor, a funder, someone who's in direct service, or even someone who um, is just living in the space. And so I'm very happy to introduce to you two women who are doing the work of environmental justice and who are also connecting that work to other local issues. So I will start by introducing Ann Pratt. She currently serves as the Director of Organizing for Connecticut Citizen Action Group, a statewide membership organization committed to advancing issues of environmental justice, tax reform, stronger democracy, and racial and economic equity. Anne also serves as the Executive Director for Connecticut Citizen Research Group. Previously, Anne served as the Executive Director of Progressive States Network, Connecticut Early Childhood Alliance, CT Parent Power, and the Interfaith Coalition for Equity and Justice. Anne works with communities and institutional leaders to create innovative strategies for social and economic change related to strengthening economic democracy, building a more sustainable green economy, and improving access to quality, affordable health care and educational disparities. Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. I'd also like to introduce you all to Jasmine Peel. She is an executive committee member of Sierra Club Connecticut. 
She is a recent graduate from the University of Connecticut, where she earned her Bachelor of Arts degree in Urban and Community Studies. She's the former organizer with CCAG, and she recently acquired a new title, which is the Zoning Assistant for the City of Norwalk. She is also uh, very much so still affiliated with Renew Connecticut, which we'll hear about shortly. Thank you, Jasmine, for joining us. So I am really excited to have both of you here and I am going to now kick it off to both of you to lead us in a short presentation. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Erica, for inviting us. It is a pleasure to be here on the Hollywood screen of our day. Uh, and the way in which we communicate with each other during this time. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but I certainly look forward to this uh, transforming into in-person very soon with the spring weather here and vaccinations, hopefully, and other things. Um, so again, thank you very much. It's delightful to be able to talk with you all about your work and our work. I am going to share our screen uh, and Jasmine and I are going to do this collectively and together. Uh, so bear with me while I do my technical screen sharing. Everybody can see that, I hope. Um, this is a PowerPoint that was actually um, designed and created by Jasmine. Thank you very much. Uh, she's uh, much better at doing beautiful pictures and designs than I am. So it's great to collaborate with Jasmine on this and many, many other uh, ways and forms. Um, so um, as Erica said, we're gonna talk about environmental justice in Connecticut and uh, also a little bit in the region and what we, um, are doing and want to do, I want to just take us a little bit back to uh, some of the uh, CCAG work, uh, Connecticut Citizen Action Group. Uh, first and foremost, a little bit about us. Uh, we are a statewide membership organization, as Erica mentioned, and we are dedicated to involving the residents of Connecticut in altering the relations of power in order to bring a more just uh, society. Um, this organization does this mission and works very, very hard to be true to this, that the way in which they approach issues is fundamentally about addressing how power issues uh, impact um, many of us uh, and uh, uh, particularly uh, middle, low uh, and black and brown communities uh, throughout Connecticut. So that's the mission. And I'm very proud to talk about some of the ways in which we've delivered that mission and on that mission. So um, I don't know if there's an echo or we good, Erica? I think so. Sometimes people might come off mute. So um, just we uh, are almost 50 years old. So I'm going to be very selective uh, in giving you a little bit of the highlights. Uh, CCAG was instrumental in passing the landmark, uh, landmark bottle bill, uh, initiated in 1980 and expanded in 20, uh, 2009, continues to be worked on even today, uh, improved hopefully, um, but we were the organization that um, basically helped to put that into reality. We also played a huge role in creating the Citizens Election Program, one of the best election programs in the country. And it is really stunning when I work with other states who don't have this program, but this program allowed so many legislators in this um, uh, state and legislators that are, are now elected because of this program and would not have been elected because of the barriers of fundraising that our political system um, burdens uh, so many people on. So proud of this particular strong democratic measure in this state. And again, when I compare it with other states uh, in the region, I'm just struck at how important it is uh, for our democracy that we have this program. Basically, there's money that people can get from the state after they raise a certain amount. And then they're limited from raising a whole lot more, which just says that you spend more time with your constituents and you are elected by your constituents. So very proud of that. Um, then uh, as a Connecticut citizen research group, uh, the nonprofit 
Uh, we did start um, and uh, worked on a lead remediation program for quite some time. I'm going to talk a little bit more about how we got there, but it is also deeply connected with the work that we're doing now and want to do in our future. Um, we, at this moment in time, our priorities include a campaign called Insure Our Future, which is holding insurance companies accountable to the investment into fossil fuels uh, here and across the globe. Again, uh, our commitment to making sure we hold the relationships of power accountable. Uh, so we're having some good uh, success in that front. Uh, we are also working on a affordable health care campaign, namely creating a Connecticut public option, expanding the Husky program, and ensuring that more people in Connecticut get good quality affordable health care. Very, very excited about that and the possibilities. Again, an issue that is um, interacting and confronting uh, the power dynamics in the healthcare industry, the major opponent to a affordable, healthy um, uh, healthcare options happens to be the insurance company. So we are in a big battle uh, with them um, currently. Uh, we have just started an education equity program that is um, uh, developing and Connecticut Renews that we will talk about in a moment. Um, I am gonna stop sharing my screen for a moment and I'm going to just share a little bit about, um, hold on a second, um, hold on. Just want to get my bearings here. Sometimes finding out where I am on the Zoom is a little bit challenging. So I just wanted to, I don't know, can you, you can't see that. Okay, hold on a second, one second. All right, here we go. Um, a little bit about um, the history uh, of some of our environmental justice work at CCAG, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Jasmine. We were founded on Earth Day, 1971. Earth Day is our birthday. And we had ongoing efforts to organize around environmental health hazards. In uh, 1978, we worked on a successful campaign to outlaw lead additives, add, additive viz in paint. 1979, we uh, helped pass the first a law regulating disposable um, toxins, first in the country. Um, and in 1980, we organized parents of children who were suffering from residential lead poisoning to address the continuing continuing and massive health problem. Um, we enacted uh, clearly defined lead poisoning standards and we worked very uh, collaboratively with landlords to make sure that homes in Hartford in particular uh, could be remediated and fixed. Um, that program continues with uh, the Connecticut um, Children's Health Hospital, I think. I raise this because it's directly impacted into what Jasmine is going to talk about in terms of some of our work on environmental justice. And without further ado, Jasmine, would you like me to share the screen and show the slide? Yes, please. Thank you, Anne. And thank you, Erica, for having us. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be in the presence of all of you and have this conversation, this dialogue. It's very important. Um, Hold on a second. I'm I'm having a little bit of technical difficulties finding the screen, and I will in a second. So, um, hold on a second. Let's see. Share, present. Okay. And now, I will share the screen. Okay. Good. There we go. Can you see that? We can. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So. Um, I kind of wanted to go over like just what environmental justice is. It's gone through, well, the term itself has gone through such a transformation in recent years. I remember when I was first studying this um, in my earlier years in um, school, it wasn't such an expansive definition. It kind of just focused on low income or people of color. But this definition that the EPA has adopted is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. And I believe this is a great definition for what environmental justice is. Not only is the, it is the acknowledgement of such um, injustices, but also 
the notion that it's it's a remediation of those injustices. It's a it's a acknowledgement that those injustices need to be um, fixed and addressed. And it's an ongoing battle. It's not something that happens overnight. But some forms of environmental hazards that promote these environmental justice movements are the existence of incinerators, landfills, wastewater treatment plants, and unfair housing, unsound housing, um, schools and homes with asbestos and houses with lead paint. All of those issues are plaguing communities that are most vulnerable and susceptible to um, these type of um, injustices and it affects low income people of color and people of color in general. It is a problem not only in Connecticut, but worldwide and nationwide. And to address these issues, um, there are nonprofits existing that um, work every day to not only call attention to these issues, but also um, collect, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Grasp collective power within communities uh, make sure that people are aware of the programs that exist and the people who are striving to help. Um, also gain um, gain voices and, and collective power from people who have been ignored for far too long. And um, one of the issues with environmental injustice and environmental racism is that it's limiting those necessary resources and the availability and the the way it's distributed um, that involves the funding of these nonprofits that are helped helping these communities and limiting benefits of social services and defunding projects for schools and disinvesting from marginalized communities. All of these make these type of communities increasingly vulnerable. I currently live in Stamford where there is a um, there's a landfill that not a landfill, sorry. It's um, it's kind of like a, a, a hill that has um, it emits dust and it emits um, um, pollution all over certain parts of Stanford and people are complaining of um, asthma and increased asthma issues and children are getting increasingly sick. So it's not um, it's not something that affects one community it affects all, all of us. So we all breathe the same air regardless. So this is an issue that um, can't be more um, pressing than now. And I can see the next slide now. Thank you, Anne. So specifically environmental racism, Connecticut. Connecticut has about 600 potential pollution sources in each of our five metropolitan areas, including Bridgeport, Hartford, New Haven, Stanford, and Waterbury. And in combination, these state, we, we house 19% of the state's pollution 20% of the potential pollution sources and 51% of the state's pollution and poverty, as well as 71% of the minority population. So these studies come from um, the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. It's been, it's been known for a while that uh, communities that are most vulnerable bear the biggest brunt of um, environmental um, injustice and environmental changes and climate change. And um, in relation to that, Black children are five times more likely to have lead poisoning than their white counterparts. Existing policies or lack thereof drive up consumer prices such as for food and energy, and they um, disproportionately hurt the poor or create obstacles that prevent the poor and the uh, marginalized for upward mobility overall. So in all, all of these problems have um, very, very lasting effects on their communities and the children of these of these communities. And it's, um, it's really becoming an issue. It's always been an issue. And um, the policies that must be adapted to in order to correct them have been um, have been tested have been um, drafted up like our green justice zones policy with renew that ha Anne has mentioned is, um, is one of the uh, issues that we one of the solutions that we are looking to address these issues, it um, creates um, community power and um, allows for um, the community to be um, funded for environmental radiation projects, whether it be correcting um, lead paint and housing or um, funding for um, 
let's say cleaning up streets or cleaning up the neighborhood, all of these um, type of environmental remedi remediation projects will be funded by this type of policy and would address some of the environmental injustice happening there. Thank you, Anne. Is there next? Oh yes, so shedding the light on some of these issues, um, the 600 um, pollution sources, they cause climate injustice, increased health issues in vulnerable communities and disinvestment and rising inequality. That's something I mentioned. Um, exclusionary zoning, um, making certain areas have better access to certain resources that better equip them to live a life of uh, upward, mobi upward mobility. <laughs> and that, that um, causes inequity, low diversity, and lack of affordable housing in those areas. And um, lack of protection for Black and Indigenous people of color, it causes rampant pollution, poor air quality, and water, as well as low accountability, and perpetuates a cycle of oppression. Because as we know, um, Black and Indigenous people of color have been um, have been uh, the first to experience the effects of the climate change and the last to receive funding and or support to remediate those issues. Um, also the last one, the lack of diversity in outdoor recreation. This would cause, this is causing low childhood exposure, increased discrimination and a decreased sense of belonging amongst black and indigenous people of color. I think that's it. And I'll pass it back to you, Anne. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm muted. And you're so, on mute, I believe. <laughs> got it. Um, thank you, Jasmine. And I, we really want to jump into this uh, more in depth and um, a, a little bit more about uh, the Connecticut Renew program that we're involved in. It's a regional coalition of six states, uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, uh, Connecticut, and we are all committed to a framework that talks about and centers overlapping crises and the solutions therein. And those overlapping crises are a global uh, pandemic that have exposed enormous income inequality that we know have already been there, uh, very well uh, pointed out by Jasmine. Uh, but this is a moment where these uh, crises are coming together uh, with also massive unemployment um, and the climate crisis. So we wanna use this moment to uh, create some bold uh, solutions. Um, green justice zones is a strategy that we want to talk a little bit more about later and would love to you know, share some more as we uh, enter into a conversation. Um, I am going to stop screen sharing so we can sort of start to do more of a conversation. Um, yeah, so this is a great model in started in Providence, Rhode Island by uh, community leaders in Providence. And they basically said, you know, don't come into our community and say, this is what you should be working on. You know, this is what you need. Actually ask the community what it wants, what it needs, how's it experiencing those kinds of issues. We did some community visioning uh, in November with uh, Danbury, New Haven, Hartford, I think Norwalk, um, maybe I'm, I'm missing a few, um, Stanford. And you know what came up from those conversations was what was really mattering, housing that's falling apart, that has mold, that has asbestos, that, that can't get energy efficiency programs, um, lack of good quality transportation, um, lack of good jobs. Um, so they began to identify in their communities how some of the environmental consequences are impacting uh, their communities. So Green Justice Zones is an opportunity to actually create a zone and a pilot project and an initiative where community uh, participation is lifted up as it relates to making sure that there are things like no incinerators, no pollution creating industries. Um, and as Jasmine said, sometimes it can be even more like um, transportation issues, but again, driven by the community and also in the green justice zones that have existed, the community also holds the powers that be accountable. 
Uh, one thing that we know that currently exists in Connecticut, uh, the governor's GC3 council, I see some people who are actually maybe even on that council and sort of everywhere in Connecticut, everybody's talking about equity, right? If you're talking about equity, somehow that advances your policy because it's the thing to talk about. And it is our experience, and I think we'll maybe even talk about this, Erica, from the perspective of uh, the Deep Waters movie that you uh, 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 spoke of, but um, you can be very well-intentioned and you can put even some legislation in place, but if you are not vigilant about making sure that it is implemented over the long haul and there's always gonna be resistance, whether that's money, whether that's territory, whether that's just a lack of will, um, you know, we believe from CCAG and there's many, many other organizations in Connecticut that believe that the government and corporations need to be held accountable. And that's just long-term work that needs to be done. And uh, that's a part of what Green Justice Zone as is organizing and as is bringing communities together to talk about this. So Jasmine, do you have anything else to add? Or? Nope, I think you encapsulated that perfectly. Um, I love the Green Justice Zones policy. It's something I've worked on a lot and I just love that it builds um, community power and, and uplifts community voices. So um, if anyone wants some more information, I'm happy to share that with you. And um, yeah, that's all I have on that. And, and we're both, Erica, happy to engage in a conversation and hear from others questions or opportunities or experiences. and. Really looking forward to the conversation. Well, thank you so much. Thank both of you so much. Um, I took messy notes over here. Uh, that was really insightful. And I really appreciate all that you both uh, mentioned. And there's so many things that my mind is thinking about right now um, because I'm thinking of some stories that I heard growing up that now makes so much more sense. Um, I'm thinking about my grandmother who was from Florida and lived by the water for years and then moved to uh, Connecticut and suffered with severe asthma. And no one really correlated that with Bridgeport. And uh, many of the, the things that Jasmine, you were particularly talking about in one of your slides. And so I think there's so much connection here about that lived experience and really highlighting the individual markers of experience and bringing them together to highlight some true systemic uh, challenges in our community. So again, thank you both so much for that robust um, information. There's a lot we, I'm certainly sure we can sit with. For the audience, if you have any questions, please feel free to write them in the chat and I can pose them to the audience or you can uh, use the raise the hand function um, and I can acknowledge that way. But to get us started in our dialogue, I do want to chat a little bit about this movie that has haunted me now for about two weeks. It is a fantastic film and it really highlights all that both of you have discussed in very interesting ways. And so if you have not watched the film Dark Waters, please do so. It's a deeply fascinating film. Uh, you can find it on Showtime. Um, if you don't have Showtime, I might lend you my subscription <laughs> login because I believe in the film that much, it's so good. But the film Dark Waters wades into some of the most complicated topics like public health, corporate accountability, classism, and law. The dramatized story is specifically about the environmental attorney Robert Billet and his nearly two decade long, I want to reiterate that, two decade long fight and also civil actions against DuPont, a chemical company. The attorney, after believing a local farmer who had 150 cattle and his cattle were all dying of unique and strange deadly diseases, he realized um, that there needed to be some accountability for this chemical corporation because they were dumping chemical waste, cancer causing waste in the waterway of West Virginia. And I mean, when I watched this film, I had to pause it multiple times because the whole time that I watched the film, truthfully, I thought, is this happening in my backyard? And I just don't know yeah. it. Yeah. And because I couldn't come to a clear answer, 
I felt even more committed to have this conversation because, you know, as I said earlier, there are people in Fairfield County and in Connecticut and even nationally, but thinking about Connecticut, folks who have an individual experience, but they may not know to connect that to something larger. And so I'm also thinking about this woman I, I met years and years ago who bought a house, really an inexpensive house, and she wanted to flip it. And her son, her and her son decided to renovate the house room by room. And there was a ton of lead and she had found out that he was eating it. This is like a real life story, someone in Bridgeport. And so again, that was an individual experience, but we can bring that up to a much more systemic level and bring it back to the slides that both of you presented. And now I can recognize that that is a pervasive challenge in our region with long-term and generational ramifications. Um, so I'm thinking about that and I want to just dive into what either one of you think is the cause for maybe some of this information gap around environmental issues and how can we be much more strategic, we as the collective we community, um, how can we be much more strategic about bringing these issues to a much more public space, whether that's social media, our personal spheres of influence, philanthropy, nonprofit community, et cetera. Wow, <laughs> that's big. I mean, I'll just jump in and say, um, you know, all of the above, yes, um, in terms of social media, but um, even as, and it's not really a simple thing, but one that should be accessible is doing things like public hearings in Connecticut and organizing people and organizing groups of people uh, through the media. Um, creating controversy is also another important thing. I know that sounds kind of um, um, unorthodox, but I think if one holds a entity accountable like in the movie, DuPont eventually was held accountable. It took a long time, right? But eventually they were held accountable and they were really drawn out and gone after. And I do think that is part of organizing sometimes, if that's the, the power that you have. And, you know, again, the movie was great. You know, there was lawsuits, there was um, lots of legal teams and they kept covering it up. They kept doing everything that they continued to do. They fought it tooth and nail, but there were incidences where they were created to be the villain. And I think sometimes that's what we do need to do in certain uh, instances. And, and sometimes that's what we do with, in organizing. I mean, you know, you have to do it within a set of values obviously, but um, just to answer a little bit. So that's my initial answer. Jasmine, I hope you jump in and add to the mix here. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I agree with both of you, uh, Erica and Anne. I, I feel like it's a compilation of all of those things, collective power and, you know, talking within your individual spheres of influence and, and using social media, but also just knowing that it's, it's um, something that's happening continuous, continuously and something that's worth fighting for. Um, not letting corporations, you know, just step on the little guy and just, you know, continue to make their money with having no accountability. And that's a big thing, accountability. We have to make sure that these corporations and these um, public and private development firms make sure that they know, and it's being known that they know <laughs> that they are causing issues within their communities, that they are building um, infrastructure that's hurting people, that they are, um, um, that they are um, driving up prices for people who, are, who can't afford to live in that area anymore. It's just spreading the world and word and not being quiet and not accepting it because ultimately these are our communities. It's something that we, not, we should not forget. We have power in our voices and, and just because we not, might not be as big as these corporations, we might not have as much money, it doesn't mean it's not a reason to fight, so. I, I just want to add too, in terms of the accountability piece, it does require, um, you know, leaders, uh, community uh, entities to um, basically get responsible corporations or entities to declare that they're going to do something. You have to get the commitment. 
um, and sometimes passing legislation. So for instance, we're working on a piece of legislation that's going through the um, state uh, legislature called uh, Ener Energy Efficiency Green Retrofit. So it's kind of building on the work that we've done at CCAG in the past, but it's basically saying low and moderate income homes or affordable homes need to be retrofitted. And in order for homes to be retrofitted with heat pumps and solar panels, they also need to be remediated. That is still a huge question. So that's a piece of legislation. It doesn't have a lot of money attached to it right right now, but when we get into that place where it actually passes and there's a good chance it will pass, the amount of accountability that's gonna be required for that to be actually implemented is huge. So the organizing that we need to do, and again, Dark Waters, Erica is a great example of that. He had to keep going back. He had to keep going back to court. Once you thought that there was a victory, right? Suddenly it turned out that they were gonna do something to protect their interests once again and deny the people who were being suffered. I mean, that's very dramatic, but I do think in once we get legislation, we have to work so hard to make sure that the monies are applied, that the remediation is done, and that those retrofits are put in. And that could be said for almost any kind of policy that comes along, always keeping the community involved in getting it passed, getting it forward, and then keeping them involved in the effort and helping them to understand that it does uh, require vigilance. Um, hopefully along the way though, we find some fun and we build some community and we celebrate our victories as well. Absolutely. Uh, but that's fascinating to me. And I'm very thankful that both of you have repeatedly touched on this concept of community power. For those of you who have been attending the bulk of our community conversations, you know we, we have talked about systems change work. And there were two um, organizing groups who talked to us about, uh, from the perspective of criminal justice and um, the long-term strategy, right, around building people power. And that's so important. And of course, it's something that here at the foundation we're giving thought to, and we do want the community's voice and perspective to always be involved in even our approach and strategy. And I think that there are ways for us to really be intentional about that long-term community involvement and keeping people engaged and really ensuring that all of our elected officials know that we're not just in this for this legislative session, but we're thinking about what's happening in our community beyond that moment. So just underscoring that. Um, I want to touch really quickly, there's questions coming in and I'm so thankful for that. So while, um, before I ask those questions, I want to touch on the regional approach, you mentioned working with folks in Rhode Island. And I think that it's very similar to something we're doing in Fairfield County around housing. And so I just want to say that I will be connecting both of you to some folks who are doing housing work, because I think there are uh, two conversations that we need to have. One is increasing units, right? We need much more housing in Connecticut. But to your point, we really have to be thinking about the housing that exists and how we're remodeling those homes. How are we um, reframing and really ensuring that folks who want to stay within their community actually have a safe home to stay in. So there's some intersection there. Absolutely. I just want to say that part of the coalition uh, we all did introduce some housing proposals at the state level and Massachusetts, I think we have a great uh, sort of bold proposal, but Massachusetts has a proposal of proposing a million homes that get um, green retrofits, rooftop solar energy, and these are new homes, but affordable homes. So it's, it's exciting to be a part of a group of people acting collectively and doing similar things and sharing resources. Awesome. That sounds wonderful. So I am going to um, highlight a couple things that are in chat right now. And again, thanks to our audience for being really responsive and engaging. So someone is looking for a link or resource for more information on the green justice zone policies. 
So if either one of you have anything that you can put in the chat, that would be awesome. And while we're doing that, there's another question that I think is important. Where in Connecticut are BIPOC communities being meaningfully engaged in EPA and state management of environmental issues, water, energy, and climate resiliency? So uh, I can answer that a bit. Um, so there are nonprofits such as ours who are engaging with the EPA and um, state managed um, infrastructure um, entities, um, including DEEP, um, who we've had um, engagement with. Um, for engagement with Black and Indigenous people of color specifically, um, there are programs offered by DEEP that um, have um, these type of resources that get children and get um, people from these type of communities out and in nature. We have those type of um, those type of programs um, offered by the state. Um, also, um, just having these type of conversations. I think DEEP and the EPA they do have. Um, these type of webinars where they um, talk with people from um, different communities. There's Mark Mitchell from um, Deep who does this type of work. Um, and if you have anything else to add, you probably do <laughs> on uh, that issue. Yeah, so I think in addition to what you just said, uh, there, there are some organizing going on in the city of Danbury. Um, around some hazard waste and environmental remediation programs there. Um, I know that the Sierra Club has doing, is doing some, some work around 100% um, just transition in some communities. But, you know, I mean, to that point, I do think that it certainly um, is something that is, um, you know, there's a lot of interest and I think it needs to be expanded. So. Uh, and there are people around the state who would like to expand it. And I, I do think it has to do sometimes with just some resources to be able to do the, the, the community engagement and the, the organizing that requires. Um, but there are definitely people around and interested in places like Hartford, and I mentioned Danbury, Waterbury has been doing some work uh, with Representative Reyes. They, uh, did some work on um, just transparency in terms of polluting industries coming in uh, to their to their community. Uh, we do have some schools that also are very interested in uh, doing some work around water and lead pipes and the infrastructure in schools. They do it sort of on a shoestring and kind of do some actions whenever it comes up. Um, so uh, I think that there's some, and I think that there could be more. Great question. Thank you so much, Tripp. And that was a great answer. Um, I believe in expanding all opportunities for organizing. So I'm just gonna overstate that because uh, the infrastructure needs many more people, uh, formal organizers, of course, but we also need participation from community. But I do think as a former organizer um, on education, it is grueling, right? Um, really challenging to engage community in any capacity but I think that we can think more intentionally about how we build that infrastructure for organizing to do that work. Um, another question that's in the chat says, um, how do we balance the impact of environmental changes in areas uh, that have an impact on local jobs, which often impact communities that need the jobs? Huh, I'd be curious to hear more about that question. I'm not quite sure I totally understand it. I mean, it's a good question, but I'm, I'm, I'm not fully in, um, clear on what the question is. Marianne, can you, do you want to unmute and pose your question to the group? Yeah, thank you. Uh, the question is, in many areas, uh, major environmental groups, the Sierra Club and others have been doing extraordinarily valuable work for years in the environmental area, but it hasn't been balanced with the impact on the communities when the changes are made, often in terms of jobs and housing, and uh, while changing yeah, uh, well, if you remove a corporation's work or mines or whatever, it has impact. So how do you balance 
against that. And certainly we want those environmental changes, but we've not given enough attention to the impact that it has on the community. That that a, yeah, no, that is a fantastic question and you're spot on. And that is and has been an issue and continues to be an issue. Um, and I think that it, you know, again, it's up to drawing from people in the community about what would make a difference for them and how, what their solutions are. At this moment in time, a lot of the current legislation being introduced and um, uh, Green Justice Zones uh, initiative have this, but um, there are provisions in, like, so for instance, in the energy efficiency retrofit program, I also believe the Massachusetts legislation, there's a whole piece there called just transition. And it's a frame, right, just transition. So people, um, if you're gonna introduce new industries or stop industries from coming into the community, how is it that you make sure that the people in the communities um, either get apprenticeship program or new training or they're somehow guaranteed uh, for making sure that they do get uh, good, well-paying jobs. Um, one other piece is what kind of projects you might wanna do in a community. So we work very closely with uh, Leticia Cologne who does energy efficiency programs in the state. Um, and one of the reasons why we wanna do the remediation on existing affordable housing units is that when you do weatherization and energy efficiency programs, those are some of the best jobs for people right there in the community. There's really good apprenticeship programs and you can pay them really good wages. So it's kind of like a real intersectional solution to a big problem. But if you have that um, uh, provision in the legislation, that's one start. Um, and it's Marian who, uh, Marianne who asked that. I, so that's one answer that I would have, but I think it's vigilance, vigilance, vigilance to make sure that when you do either say this industry, uh, like, so if, it, if, it's, if you know that there are, you know, manufacturers in your community that do uh, mechanical, I, I don't know, some sort of industrial work uh, and you want them to go, you wanna make sure that those jobs um, are replaced with jobs so that people in the neighborhood and in the community uh, can can still have. So um, all to say yes and vigilance and uh, if people on this call have good solutions and ideas uh, to incorporate in that, um, I think once you put that out as a value and you say, this is really important, how can we meet that? Like what would make difference for you in your community? What would be some of your solutions is also what we ask in anything that we do. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, so Henry has a question for Jasmine. Um, he wants to know what's the specific area in Stanford that emits uh, significant pollution? Do we know the exact location? Yes, we do. And you'd be surprised. It's a beautiful area. It's very coveted. Everybody wants to live there who lives in Stanford. And if you don't already know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about Harbor Point. Yes, right by the water, the development um, agency BLT is muy muy malo. And they are building, um, they're making a lot of developments. They're building these high rise luxury apartments and using very crap materials. And it's very bad for the people around who live there, people are, ex are experiencing increased asthma rates and, and respiratory issues. And you would never know because there aren't enough studies or there's not enough funding, quote unquote, for these studies for people to find out if this is the cause and how it could be remediated and how we can stop that from happening. And if you wanna learn more, I have the perfect person to connect you with, David Michelle. He knows everything about everything about this issue. I have his email, I can link it in the chat for you if you wanna have a conversation with him. Yes, thank you. And please make sure you put that email in there so we all can reach out to him. Um, Diane has a question. Do you include highways and major roads that cut through neighborhoods and pollute in your 600 pollution sources? Yes. Um, so. It's a great question. Those, um, those statistics all, um, actually come from um, the DEEPS website. I'm not exactly sure how they measure that, but I'm sure that it's, it could be a lot more than that. It could be a lot more people who are affected 
by um, by highway traffic through these type of neighborhoods. Um, well, all of our neighborhoods really, um, but that's something I can find out more for you. It just seems like, especially in Fairfield County, we've sliced through neighborhoods and isolated lower income neighborhoods on one side of the highway and you know other neighborhoods on the other. So in addition to the pollution impact, it's the, uh, you know, just the, the separation of, of neighborhoods and, and populations. Yes, absolutely. I agree with you. That and exclusionary zoning, um, not well, not exclusionary zoning, but zoning in general, um, that most of our cities, all of our cities have um, ties to the, the bad zoning practices um, in the um, early 1900s in this country. Um, but yes, you're, you're, you're very right on that. Um. So I have one, uh, one question here that is coming from Danielle. She's wondering if you have anything to say about the scandal over the fill pile in Fairfield and how that might have been spread throughout Fairfield and neighboring towns. And Danielle, feel free to give any other context if you'd like. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with that. So I'm not gonna be very helpful for that. I'm sorry. I too would need some context. Um, I don't think I'm familiar either, but I would love to know about it. Okay, I'll definitely send it more information. Thank you. So, well, thank you all. This is a very robust conversation. We have a couple minutes left. So I don't, I just wanna highlight um, a couple of other things that are in the chat. Um, Karen is saying it would be great to see a fluid map of environmental justice campaigns underway in Connecticut with lead nonprofits identified too. Can I echo that? Just thinking about the ecosystem and who the players are, where the support lies and also where there might be some intersectionality. So thank you, Karen, for bringing up that point. Diane is saying that she is on a working group. There are groups focusing on equity and environmental justice with continuing work of um, GC, the Governor's Climate Change Report. So that's good to know. And again, if anyone is interested in connecting with anyone who is in the audience on these issues, please feel free. There are many people here with lots of expertise. Awesome. So I do have another question that I'd like to pose because I've been thinking about this for um, quite some time. And you mentioned power building and ensuring that community voice is really at the center of your not only work, but strategy. And so how do you measure success as an organization? because you also talked about living beyond the moment of a bill being passed. So how do you measure success in your work? Great question. Um, and there's many ways to measure success. Uh, one would be actually getting something, a victory, getting something accomplished. Um, and certainly, you know, when a bill passes, uh, that's a huge accomplishment. And again, um, it's sort of the first step though, then we measure it like actually how does it impact people's lives. So I would say a huge indicator is are we really making a difference in people's lives. So uh, let's just take the housing bill that we have uh, that's going through the housing committee. It's looking very good. We're very, very hopeful. Um, but and, and let's say it passes, right? Big success. Uh, but I won't and, and, and the people working on the bill as, as should happen, um, it is a success when we actually have homes that are free from lead and mold and um, you know, environmental hazards and have good strong weatherization, have heat pumps, have solar panels and have lower utility bills. To me, that's the long game in terms of how people's lives are impacted directly. So that's a huge indicator and in knowing that is a long uh, trek. And then another way that we measure success is how is it that leaders involved in our organizing uh, transform them, 
themselves, their lives, and their own source of power. We talk a lot about power. So power is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just the capacity to act. And if people come together and they can effectively change the situations that they exist in, and they uh, increase the power of their community and the power of the voice. But also, also we have a, a, another piece and component uh, that we're um, very focused on is that if you want to run for office, uh, that is also another way in which you can transform your life. Uh, so um, running for office and running for office in such a way that you are deeply connected to the values of kind of what brought you into the office, you know, community organizing and running for office and governing from a place of community organizing and those values is a huge measure of success. So I would say those would be some of the things that I would measure for our success. And I, that's a good, such a good question, Erica. And I love to ask that of people when I do my facilitation. So if I have a group of leaders in a room and they wanna do something, first thing I do is what does success look like? Okay, you have success. What does it feel like? What's happening in your life that's different? What's happening in other lives? And, and it's it's a really important question because we oftentimes don't ask that of ourselves. So thank you for asking that. You're welcome. And I think it's a great way for all of us as listeners to really think about the assumptions that we make around success. Um, it's definitely not one specific thing. There's iterative success, which you alluded to. Um, there's global success where a community at large might experience it. Uh, but I think many times in community, there's also individual success. And, and I'm always interested in what an individual participant in a movement, such as many of the ones that both of you are leading, find success in. And um, of course, that builds agency within that person and also in the wider world. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, I did put in the chat and I just wanted to reiterate it, but I'm thinking about the young people in Bridgeport who were organizing with Make the Road um, a couple years ago. And there's so much, again, intersection around education, small business, public health, transportation, housing, and environmental issues. And so um, I think that now I'm wondering how do we involve more young people in this movement? And, and do you find that there are young people who are present and active in your campaigns? And if not, uh, what are some ways that folks on the call who have access to young people might be able to help with that? Yeah, that's a great question as well. And we have been doing some student organizing around the education equity issues. Uh, we've done some advocacy training. Um, you know, uh, we've at training actually, education and training on how do you actually make things work? How do you testify? What does the legislative process look like? How do you become a leader? That is very compelling. And then when you actually move those students into action in Waterbury, we had a training with students and then they lifted up the issue that was most important to them, which was in Waterbury, the existence of really bad student disciplinary um, policies and kids getting arrested. So they did an action on the Board of Education and they testified about what was going on in their schools. And they were able to secure a meeting with the Board of Ed uh, president and make some incremental um, changes. But again, um, you know, having that long haul, um, you know, students uh, went on to college, there was not the kind of organizing that needed to be done to continue that. So um, again, when you say what does success look like, sometimes success looks like making sure you have uh, the capacity to continue to the fight as long as you need to continue that fight, right? And student organizing takes real capacity to do. Indeed, it definitely does. Um, well, we are at time and I just wanna make sure that we're honoring that. Thank you all so much. This was um, a very robust conversation. I certainly learned a lot and I hope that all of you in the audience did as well. Thank you so much to Jasmine and Anne. Um, I am adding to the chat right now a survey that you or anyone that you know can fill out. It's from the Connecticut Metropolitan Council of Governments. Um, they are working on um, a comprehensive economic development strategy and they're looking for engaged citizens to 
uh, provide insight and um, perspective. So please feel free to um, click that link and let your voice be heard. Thank you again. I'm going to now share my screen because I want everyone who is participating to ensure that you are connected to um, the work as it continues, right? And so if you have any questions for Anne, her email address is there on the screen, as well as the website where you can find more information about the green, uh, the green zones, as well as many of their other campaigns. And if you have any questions for me about the community capacity building work that we do here at Fairfield County's Community Foundation, please feel free to email me and of course, find us on social media to stay up to speed about all the great work that we do. Thank you all so much and please have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, everyone. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you to all. Thank you. Thank you all.